final speaker for the semester. Can you believe the semester just went by really super quickly? And then next uh, next Monday we start the process of making the retalo. So I thought it'd be a good way to sort of end the, the semester with our speakers, inviting Sean. And Sean is the is a Santero, and he's also the events coordinator at the Chicano Humanities uh, Chicano Humanities and Arts Council. So if you would join me in welcoming here to, uh, to, to Regis Campus and to the library. Thanks, Tony. Well, thank you guys. Thanks for coming this morning and allowing me to be here. I know sometimes these things kind of get kind of nerve-wracking and stuff like that, but at the end of the day, it's fun. You know what I mean? This is what I do, and um, what's unique about it, it's only like a handful of people that do it in our community. So. I think it's kind of my duty to come out here and, and, and talk to you all and share what I do with uh, on a daily basis. Um, and what you guys are learning. You guys are already learning the Santos and Restablos and the books and Father Stills, all these, all these you know, things that you guys are, are diving yourselves into. I'm, I'm in it every day. You know, I'm creating. My, my creative process is always going. It's always going. It's always around that. And... Um, so a little bit about myself, I'm um, Sean. I'm, uh, I'm fourth generation right here in Denver. I'm a son of North Denver. Um, my father, they actually went, everybody's we're all North High alum. Um, I actually went to Denver School of the Arts myself. Actually, I went to St. Catherine's School over here on 46th and this is a Catholic school right over here on 46th and Federal. And then I went to Denver School of the Arts. And um, I graduated from MSU, and now I am currently uh, the events coordinator at the Chicano Humanities and Arts Council. If you guys aren't familiar with it, it's a uh, Chicano art gallery that started here in, uh, in Denver, probably around, around 1978, and Tony's been a huge part of that organization, and, I kinda, and they've had a, a strong community of Santeros that you know, practice Spanish colonial artwork there, and I got involved there. and. I discovered Santos myself. So, um, growing up as like as an artist, even as an art student, um, just as an individual, period. I didn't know like I wasn't connected to my my culture. I didn't. It wasn't. Uh, it, being from North Denver, a Chicano from North Denver, uh, we were taught, you know not to speak Spanish. We were taught, or my father's generation was taught not to speak Spanish. You know, you had a blue collar life, you do things by the book and you do good and you do good in your life and you know, you make a good, you know, uh, make a good for your, your, your kids and everything else like that. So it, it's not like we were fully immersed in New Mexican culture or, or Spanish or you know, Mexican culture or anything. Our, our people were from there, but you know, being out here in, in, in Denver, we were, I guess we were kind of isolated, or they were kind of isolated, you know? So, um, so as an artist, you know, I was, I always knew I had a gift. I, you know, I was like always painting and drawing and things of that sort, and um, my parents allowed me to do that as a young child. So I had the, 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 creative, the creative freedom to do what I wanted to do as an artist, even in art school. It was, I did everything. I did photography, I did oil painting, I did ev anything under the book you could possibly think of, I did it. And it doesn't necessarily think it had to do with Santos or New Mexican art or Mexican art, Chicano art. It had absolutely nothing to do with that, period. Because I didn't know what it was. And then, but at, as an adult, I started getting into my age, 18, 19, you know, nothing. It wasn't talking to me anymore. And as a creative individual, you know, as an artist, even no matter if you're a painter or a writer, whatever it is, you need inspiration. You need to know what's coming from within because that is your truth. Your truth comes out. And nothing was talking to me, nothing at all, you know, and I had to come see a few of my elders and my elders told me, he says, you know, go back to the basics. What are your basics? And what were my basics? You know, family, faith, and culture. Right? And so we kind of, you know, we grew up around, you know, a lot, you know, with our, with our, I'm, I'm a practicing Catholic, I know, I, I mean, I'll just put that out there, you know, it's a, it's a huge part of my life, and family, you know, my family is, family is everything, it was always everything, and then culture, who was I as a person of culture, I knew I was something, but what was, what, what was it, you know what I mean, so, 
uh, I dabbled, I got involved over at the Chalk Gallery. Uh, and it was such an institution where so many people have found that place. So they, people of, you know, of Hispanic, Chicano, Latino descent have you know, found home at that Chalk Gallery and they found themselves as artists or they were able to express themselves on, on a cultural aspect. And I discovered myself as like, you know, these are where my people come from. And then I started doing genealogy and it's like, well, hello, you know, everybody's from New Mexico, you know, and everybody has these deep roots, you know, in southern Colorado, these deep roots in, in, in northern New Mexico and these deep penitente roots and these deep santero roots. And it was like, well, this is, let me, let me, let me, let me explore this avenue. So I got it and I started meeting the Santeros here and I started meeting the Santeros in New Mexico because I wanted what they had. And I says, I want to, I want the knowledge you guys have. What is it that you guys know? You know, and then they gave me the foundation. Well, this is what it is. Here, here are the books. Here's where you could go. Here's the institutions where you can go see the Santos in your community. And I did. And it clicked. I was like, this is it. This is for me. Art, family, faith, you know, everything all came together. And then I started creating Santos and I was, you know, it was like there was a fire that was, that was fueling me. Not only was it fueling my creative, my creative passion, but it was creative, it fueling me in a, in a, in a faithful manner. You know, it was, it was fulfilling me on that level. And, you know, when you mix all these two together and then when you're manifesting something that's so passionate with inside you and you're creating something so it's physical that people can touch and people can see and people you can put on a wall, you know, that's, that's raw. You know, that's, that's the raw feeling that, you know, any artist has. But then you take that back to the early Santero days and that's exactly what they were doing. So I found myself in that same position and reading these, these books by Father Still and, you know, seeing the old Santos here at Regis, even the old Santos over at the Art Museum and even over there in, in New Mexico, all over the churches. And it was like what they were going through at that point in time in their lives, creating these beautiful Santos and these beautiful altar screens, I naturally gained that, you know, just from my own, you know, my, me seeking a path that I wanted to get on. So then I kind of knew that, okay, maybe this is, maybe I am a Santero. I don't like to call myself, I don't like to put myself in labels or names or, you know, I have a thing about teams, how everybody wants to be a part of a team. That's okay, you know what I mean? But uh, I think I was given an ability. I was giving, I was set, some, somebody laid a path out for me to follow and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Everything about this Retablo style of Santero work and that you guys have been learning and everything else like that, that is, it's, you know, it's a blend between both worlds. And I myself had a, an, an identity crisis. It's like, well, what are you? Are you Mexican? Are you American? Or, you know, are you, what are you? Chicano, there's so, many, there's so many different labels. And it's just like, well, one, like I said, I don't like to put labels on myself, but I do like to, you know, kind of figure out where my people come from. And I am a, a solid mix of indigenous and a solid mix of European. This has always been our foundation. This will always be our foundation, my foundation as an artist, the old traditional style, you know? So now, how do I transfer this into, you know, where I'm at right now in 2018, 2019? And that's up to me to figure out. But I know that, you know, it's like, when I'm doing that, you know, that's the, the evolution that they, they've always had from the 1800s to the 1900s, even now, you know, so. The, the true essence of a Santero is, is his faith and how, you know, you connect with when you're painting on that retablo and that santo that you're painting, you know, so that is the most important thing, you know, so. What do you think is the best way um, to get younger people involved and interested in San Santos and Santero making, becoming a Santero? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the best way, I think, is just doing this, what I'm doing now. Just kind of just talking to you guys about what it is. And also, uh, I had a discussion with, I don't know if you guys ever seen Tony's pieces, his retablos, but, you know, I, I'm fascinated by them. 
because it is the it is it is the style of a retablo, but it, it it has these images of what is it pop culture and you know things of that you know the, the Frida and you know the Wonder Woman and things of that of that sort. But you know, but the idea behind it is, you know, not a lot of people can relate to Catholicism. You know, if you do, then that's you. We all have our individual past, but. Uh, I know this was, it was the grassroots behind all this is Catholicism, but not a lot of people can. Even now in, in our day and age, in 2018, a lot of millennials, you know, even kids, I, I mean, I'm 31 years old, but, in, but most people my age, you know, are so distant from religion or they're really close with religion. So, and a lot of them are really distant. But in some essence, they, had, they still do have a religion. And it's what we look at on a daily basis. You know, what we follow, the, our, 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 our electronics, things that we're always connected to, we're always drawn to, the images we're always seeing on TV. You know, what drives us, you know, to constantly look at that feed, constantly look at those emails? What are, who are those people? You know what I mean? And it's the same thing as walking on our knees, you know, to see the Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe. You know, there's something driving us. There's something driving us. It's that we don't know what it is. It's kind of hard, you know, but I constantly think about that. So to give you guys a foundation of what this was, you know, of Catholicism and, and the driving of faith and, and the religion and aspect, it's like, so that's that. So when we see retablos like Tony's, when there's images such as Wonder Woman, you know, we see these things on it. What, now, what are the images that we can see that are going to speak volumes just as much as San Ignacio? Anybody know San Ignacio as Saint Ignatius? He's, he's the Jesuit, and he's Saint, Saint Ignatius of Loyola. And, you know, his sword, his book, you know, or San Rafael and his fish, you know. We, we've all grew up with the Mickey Mouses and the Winnie the Poohs and, you know, things of that sort, you know. But what drew us to that? What, what, what are the symbols behind him, you know? Was he an image of, of power? Was he an image of, you know, unity? Was he an image of, you know, evil? We don't, you know, it's all your interpretation. So I think as young people, we have, we have, when we look at art and things of that sort, you know, you have to, you know, really look at the symbols behind a lot of it. And then you create that, and then you could manifest that into, Iconography, just like Santos, so <laughs> uh, that's what's unique about it, and that's what I'm trying to do, especially over at Chalk Gallery, you know, uh, that where I'm given a platform to to really, you know, teach about traditional Santero work, you know, because I, that is important, you know, especially an art form as old as this, with a very hand, handful of people that are doing it, you know, that's important that I need to, you know, share but it's also important to get that group that really wants to take it a, for, you know, a step further. So what I do is at first, when I first started making retablos, uh, it's all, all started from curiosity. You know, it's like, well, I, need, I know it's from wood and I know there's gesso that you buy from the store and things. So I bought, you know, regular commercial gesso and it was just like another thing. You always want to evolve as an artist. You always want to learn what, how were things done the traditional way. And so I, I met this artist, Ron Miera, and he's in, a, he's in a, uh, upstairs, if you wanna go see his retablos up there, he's got a couple up there. And, uh, he's actually in the show here too as well, but um, he's a mastermind at creating from natural pigments. So he gave me a workshop on just the basics. This is how you do it, this is where you go, and you take it from there. And I did, and I got the idea, and then I got the books and I started doing all the research myself. And he, I still, to this day, he tell, he's, I have this, this, uh, this line stuck in my head about, he says, if you see color in anything natural, he's like, you can make a pigment from it. So anytime I'm always, my brain is always thinking, I'm like, there's a green right there. I can make a color from that. As long as you know the process of it, you know? And there's, you know, I also, you know, you have to know between how to, to work with the dirts, the sands, and then the plants. And um, there's also a bug, you know, and then, there, you know, the, 
there's a Kochi Neal that I use. I hardly use it because I'm not a big fan of purple, but I should because, you know, the color, the history behind it. Does everybody know the history of Kochi Neal? It's a gorgeous, beautiful beetle, and it's like, it's this kind of color right here. Anyway, it, gr it grows, or it's, it feeds in the, in the agave plant, and the Spaniards found it when they, they, they found Tenochtitlan, and, but the Aztecs, would, when they were at their height, they used cochineal to dye, you know, their, a lot of their clothes. Even some of the women would, would eat the beetle, the membrane of the beetle, and it would dye their teeth purple. That was a sign of like royalty and things of that sort. So when the Europeans found this purple, you know, they're like, God, purple, you know, it's like, cause purple in Europe was like, that was total royal color right there. So, I mean, it's an ancient color. You know, I mean, uh, it's a good one. And I use chicken bones too. And so the other day, you know, we were just eating chicken and I was like, well, I wonder if we char these out, you know, what would happen? And it gave me the, a specific color that I was looking for. And it was the, the color of a Franciscan robe. And you know, if you've seen a lot of images of the Franciscans, have they, they were brown, St. Francis and his birds and his little puppies and his dogs. And uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, in Europe, they had, the Franciscans were brown, you know, but when they came to New Mexico, when, the, when they were settling in New Mexico, this Franciscan, they were part of the order of the Immaculate Conception. So they wore blue robes. And so I like to use this indigo plant. I found with, I got with it, with a, a weaver in Taos, New Mexico, gorgeous. You have to come come look at it, but it's very, oof. If you get this on your clothes, phew, it's another story. But uh, I use that with the chicken bones, and it gives me a gorgeous, you know, color like that. Um, but what what I do is, you know, I get my my pigments, all my sands, my indigos, um, my chicken bones, whatever it may be, and I grind them in my mortar or pestle. You know, grind them fine, 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 fine. Almost like a consistency as this right here. This is like, it's almost like makeup. You know, it's just like fine, fine powder. And then I add a binder. Um, some, I think back in early times I used yucca plant, and, but some, I, I don't have access to yucca plant. I mean, I live in the city, so. I use um, gum arabic as a simple binder, and it, that 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 that's my friend. Then you know I let it dehydrate, and then it gives me my palette to paint with. Um, now my gesso, that's an also another traditional process. Um, I use gypsum, marble dust, and rabbit skin glue, and that's kind of like there's a there's a method to that madness right there too because you're almost like you're cooking pancake batter and you get a lot of bubbles and you can get a lot of inconsistencies and everything else like that but it's simple rabbit skin glue you know and gypsum gypsum was a heavy uh, mineral it was very abundant in new mexico so a lot of people use gypsum and the gypsum obviously you know they people use it in, uh, in drywall and stuff like that so it kind of it's like that chalky paste and so once you get that pancake batter, you know, it gives you your whiting. And it's almost like you're painting with, with painting on chalk, you know, like, uh, you know, you have your, you felt like a piece of chalk before, right? That's essentially what this is, is what you're painting on. And it takes the natural pigments so well. And, you know, there's a lot of, uh, all the santeros, you know, the artists that, that practice this, they all have their their form, their you know their ways and you know how to get it perfect and everything else like that. Me, I'm more of like I'll get my recipe right, and sometimes it'll come out really smooth. You know, like I'll see how this one is really just like really smooth, and sometimes it comes out really rough. You know, look at the the, the consistency on that. You can see the the brush strokes in that, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. It gives it character, I think. Even back in the, in the early Santero days, you know, they, they're using old materials and using old things to create, you know, to create pieces of artwork. It, it, it's very, what we call, there's a term, we call it rasquache. <laughs> so, uh, you know, using what you have to create something beautiful. So um, that's my gesso. And, you know, some of these, a lot of these colors are very much, you know, who I am. I'm very much 
a son of Colorado, a son of Denver. But my ancestors, my people come from New Mexico. So I'll, my colors, like I said, the indigo, New Mexico, the indigo plant. I get a, a green, a green color. This is a beautiful, gorgeous green. And that's from Placitas, New Mexico. I get this yellow. I get this yellow ochre from Boulder, almost a little bit of El Dorado. Um, so that's, uh, that's a color, you know, that's, that's who I am. And then this is La Bojada. This is out by Santa Fe. As soon as you get out of Santa Fe, when you're going to, to Albuquerque, you have this beautiful, you know, skin tone. And Chamiso, we have Chamiso all over. This is a plant and Chamiso is all over the mountains. Yeah, I mean, you just take a stroll up there for a quick hike and you see plant. There's so many Chamiso plants. It's the beautiful yellow plant. And then this is my favorite one right here. This is Red Rocks. This is right here, Red Rocks Amphitheater. You ever go there to see a concert and you're walking in the parking lot, next thing you know, you get in the car and you're like, oh my God, my shoes are all red, you know what I mean? It's the sand, you know, that's even the, the when the Spaniards came and settled here in Colorado, you know, they, it, it was the color red, their color red was everywhere. It's even, it's on the, the rocks here, on the building over at the chapel and everything. It's all, this is our soil. This is who we are. This is Colorado right here. It's giving you a gorgeous red ochre. And so, yeah, like I said, you know, a lot of the colors I had specifically choose, you know, because essentially what you're, when you're, what you're creating here is, is a manifestation of who you are, you know, as a Santero, you know. I think it would be false for me to, to create something that was just a complete copy of what they're already doing in New Mexico or what they've already have done. So um, the process, like I said, the process is, is old, but the creative, you know, and, and the imagery and everything else like that, that's, that's always evolving. And I also taught myself how to carve. So it's not like there's a school for, I mean, you guys are lucky because, you know, you have a class with Tony and here, like in this institution where you can kind of give you like an idea, you know, of, of Santero work and stuff like that. But there's not really a school of, you know, San, for the Santeros used to go to or things of that sort. I mean, there's people who give, you know, personal workshops and stuff, but it's really up to you. You know, even the early Santeros, the Moyenos, the Aragons, you know, the Lagunas, they had to teach themselves, you know what I mean? Or they learned from other santeros, you know? So um, I taught myself how to carve <laughs> and I can't even tell you how many times I've been in the hospital for cutting my hands or whatever. But you know, it's like when there's a will, there's a way, I guess. But you know, I get my, my, my aspen, I use the aspen, aspen's easier to carve. Uh, pine, you know, sometimes that has a lot of, of, of knots and things of that sort, but aspen's good for me to carve. And, you know, I just, you know, draw it out, you know, you just all start out with the sketch and I carve it and then I just lay my, my, there's no tracing whatsoever. So then I lay my, my, you know, I just let my sketch out and then I start laying my, my lighter colors down. So you guys are getting ready to start painting your retablos. Don't go full force with your black or full force with your reds or your heavy dark colors, you know, lay your light ones down, you know, get some skin tone, you know, make them look nice and, you know, get, get some shadow in there. And even like with the, with the, uh, with your indigos on your robes and things of that sort, you know, just start light and then work heavier, you know, you want this, you want your retablo to kind of last you, you know, you don't want to look at it when we're fifties and our sixties and we're just like, oh man, I really shouldn't have taken my time on this one. You know, you got the opportunity now, you know, and really take advantage of it. Oh, and here's another thing I want to kind of mention. I get this a lot in Santa Fe. Um, Byzantine iconography, everybody familiar with Byzantine iconography? Uh, they're just, you see them in like Russian, they're Christian icons, they're, they have this certain unique style and they lay so many different layers down and they use eggplant and it's very, I mean, you see them all over in the Vatican. They probably have them all over here in, in, at the university here too, but each layer is, is a prayer. You know, it's a very, you know, it's, a, it's, it's all a form of prayer on those icons, you know, and I get that. Well, is that the same way that when you're creating New Mexican Santero work? And essentially, you know, it's not as strict and regimented where I got to say Hail Mary here and I got to say on our Father here. You know, it's not like that, but... 
it is a very spiritual process, you know, for me, at least. I'm not saying I'm not putting it, you know, in your context, but for me, it is. You know, it's, it's discipline. It's uh, patience. It's me, you know, reflecting on who I am, what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. And it's also you, me connecting with the santo, you know, St. Anthony is my patron saint. Why is St. Anthony my patron? What is his story? You know, how can I learn from St. Anthony? All these questions, all these thoughts and ideas go through my head when I'm creating this santo. And so essentially at the end of the day, when, it, when it's your final product, you look at it and you're like, wow, you know, you put, you were present. I was present when I was doing this, when I created this, everything that I was able to offer in this, in this painting, I did it. So uh, also think about that, you know what I mean? Think about like the process behind it and, and who you're painting and, and the, just the respect, you know, the respect factor that goes behind it. Because yeah, it's one thing to paint, get a piece of canvas and, and toss some paint on it and stuff like that. But, you know, this is one of those old school art forms that really kind of just brings you back to you. You don't even have to be Chicano or Latino or Catholic or anything else like that. It's just like, it's almost even as if you were, you know, I say this a lot, is if you were carving a stone the same way they were carving it back in ancient Egypt, you know, you, that you can just respect that, right? Wouldn't you? Like if you, somebody gave you the ideas and the tools and the methods to do that and you were doing it, you would be fully present there doing that. It's the same way here, you know? Uh, so, it, you know, the, the, like I said, the process, the paints, you know, you, when you guys get your paints, and I know Tony says you guys are going to start using some natural pigments and stuff like that, you know, don't get intimidated. At the end of the day, I think of it, I was really intimidated by using natural pigments and everything else like that, but it's like, no, essentially what I'm making is, is watercolors, you know, from elements from all over the earth, and that's what you're painting with is watercolors. And oh, there's a specific technique right here, too, it's called, and, it, and everybody see this border right here? And you can do this in your retablos because you guys are going to be using uh, traditional gesso. It's called scrofito. And it's basically used just from a, from a, I use a dental, I use a dental pick or uh, a calligraphy pen sometimes. And I just scratch, I'll paint my, I'll lay my, my, my layer of paint down first and then I'll start scratching, you know, beautiful designs, you know, because white was kind of a hard color to come by naturally you know there was a lot of lead based and you know you know lead based paints you know you can go blind from that you already have a bunch of white you know what I mean on your gesso so why not bring it through with the scrofito and make these gorgeous gorgeous designs right here so that's an old technique as well and you can see those in the old Santero works especially with uh with the, uh, the Laguna Santero. So, uh, final touch with the retablo, I don't know if you guys are using, is the Trementina. And the Trementina is, is hand-picked. We, my mentor Frank and, and Carlos, they're both uh, Santeros here in, in Colorado. We go out and we go harvest the, the piñon sap out in, uh, in uh, Truchas, uh, or Tezuki, I'm sorry. And what we do is we literally go inside these trees at the first freeze of the year. And then we pick out the sap, the sap rocks, right? And it's a fun process. So we get dirty and we get scraped up and, you know, and, but it's fun. It's exactly what they do. And so you get these rocks and you get a, put a, fill them in a big jar, you know, just like this. This is kind of, this is kind of like a, a little condensed version of this, but uh, then you put grain alcohol in it. And the grain alcohol breaks down that sap, and it and it kind of separates the sap into, you know, from the wood and from the pine and everything else like that, and it gives you kind of like a wash. And you guys can come smell it too. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty powerful stuff. But you know, once you put it on your retablo, it seals your retablo, and they, have you, you, and they kind of age to perfection, I think. You've seen some of the old retablos, they have this gorgeous brown, uh, like just finish to it. That's the sap, essentially the sap, when it, when it gets old, it just turns brown and it just makes them beautiful. And then they smell good. Once you hang them in your house, 
it's just like it just smells like pinon or pine you know it's it's, it's nice it's, it's refreshing so you guys will be able to come smell that here here in a minute so this would be probably like a, a jar like this of rocks you know sometimes you get little tiny ones like that and sometimes you get really big ones you know all depends and you got to jump from tree to tree to tree have you ever picked pinon before yeah it's a process right I mean, it's just the same thing. It's just like you're in there and you're, you're, it's a lot of muscle grease and it's a lot of, you know, stabbing with a pick or a knife. And then sometimes you get small things and sometimes you don't, you know. But yeah, it's, it's a lot of work, you know, just to get some of that sap. And so just like this right here, I mean, whew, that'd probably be like a couple hours worth of harvest. And that's just that, you know. But what's also cool, kind of like, I'm, I don't know if there's any truth behind this, but the natives used to use resin um as you know like a form of prayer you know and now that we're using to kind of make the correlation between that and how we're using resin on our pieces and these pieces that we use for veneration as well you kind of make that connection there it's just like how those two fall into place i don't know if it's by coincidence or if the kind of spanish the spanish kind of like molded those in i don't know i don't know but it's it's kind of interesting how the natives would use that as a spiritual thing and then we'd use it as a spiritual thing as well my palette is very earthy and i use oh gosh i use a handful of colors maybe five or six colors you know and you'll see some of these retablos you know that are you know created nowadays oh they got the pinks the the light blues and the fluorescent colors and that's great don't get me wrong you know that's beautiful that they look great and they're fantastic but me i'm a very earth tone you know i'm very connected with the earth i'm a capricorn and i'm just like those those warm colors they they keep their they keep me at ease and when you're creating this you know these 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 retablos you know not only that are, are you you know you're already on like a different plane spiritually but you know when you're painting though your palette you know the colors those become feelings as well and those the warm colors and I get that a lot they're like oh your colors are so warm and they're so earthy and I was, I'm like yeah well if this was food it'd be organic you know what I mean so so this this placita is green right here I was telling you about this is a specific place in New Mexico and uh, Santeros have been using this one forever because the sand there is just absolutely gorgeous. It's this color green. But see this right here? That's what it looks like. That, see that kind of, it's not, it's not like a heavy green. It's not like a very much of a lime green really, but that's what it is. This black, this, this red rocks, that's the, the heart of the color. This walnut. I kind of use as like a brown shadow in there. That yellow is obviously uh, my 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 yellow oxide I get from Boulder. And Ron, my the guy who taught me how to do this, this this blue right here is it's an Egyptian blue. Now I don't know what the correlation is between New Mexico and Egyptian blue, but. What I do know is that he got this color and it was the same Egyptian blue that they used in the Egyptian hieroglyphs. I thought it was a cool color. Why not? It's, it's you know, it's not traditional New Mexican, but it's a, you know, it's a natural color from a beetle. And then there's my yellow ochre. Here's another one. Here's an example of the, the, black, the black walnut right here on the crown of thorns. This is the sacred heart of Jesus. And here's that, that uh, the placitas. And this is the sacred heart of Jesus. And this is the, the sacred heart of Our Lady of Sorrows. Our Lady of Sorrows has seven swords for the seven sorrows of, you know, the Blessed Mother. And then and here's St. Anthony. This is a fun one. I like this one. And, you know, sometimes you just got to, you know, with your style and everything, you just got to play with it, have fun with it, you know, like with here, with your curtains. Oh, here's a fun. You'll see a lot of, uh, a lot of curtains. Think about this in your retablo. It kind of makes it really, really New Mexican, too. 
is a lot of they have they have curtains on them. Now the curtains were put there because it was that it was seen as if you were looking into the eyes of the divine, as the, into the eyes of the holy one or the holy people. So you have you know your saint right here. So you, they all have a little curtain right there. You can get really cool designs and fun with that. So here's my red rocks, my indigo. That's the Lavojada color. And this black is actually ash or charcoal, I'm sorry. Just regular charcoal. Everybody had painted with charcoal on, you know, just with your fingers and stuff like that. Same stuff here. And that shine, and that's your, and that's your, uh, your, your pignon sap. That's your finish. So another thing I want to share with you guys is I'm actually engineering a eight foot tall ultra screen with the help of Tom uh, here for Regis University. And we're doing it for, uh, in honor of Father Steele. And this thing is gonna be completely 100% traditionally made. It's engineered to where the, we don't, there's no nails. You know, there wasn't any nails used in the old Chimayo altar screens or anything else like that. Everything is carved. Uh, this process, the, the painting the, the, of the gesso it's going to be laid on this thing and it's you know eight feet by seven feet wide or eight feet by six feet wide i'm sorry and it's a collaboration between a handful of the santeros right here in colorado so but the essence of it is is we want to honor father Steele, and you guys obviously read his books and what he has done here not only is he a pioneer for regis university and in, in, in saving you know santos here in, at regis but also for the state of Colorado, you know, as time goes on, you know, especially here in, in, in our state, you know, a lot of other things are starting to take place, you know, in, in the art world. But Father Steele was that one that, you know, really laid the foundation for Santero work and for Santeros like myself and other artists to kind of just do this kind of work and to let it be known that we are, we are here in Colorado. Thank you, Father Steele. You know what I mean? We are making noise and we are carrying the torch. You know, growing up, I always had like uh, a, a connection with the Blessed Mother. So a lot of my retablos, I some I do I, my early retablos were very, you know, feminine in that aspect. But you know, things talk to you. You know, your experiences talk to you on a daily basis. And then when your experiences talk to you like that, you kind of interpret them. I to interpret them in a in a faith manner, right? or sometimes you know, not always in a faith manner, but. How do I interpret them as an individual through the lens of faith, I guess, yeah, through the lens of, you know, good, evil, uh, all that. And who's, who out there do I know who, who is going to help me, you know, manifest those, those feelings? The, the San Rafael, the San Juan Nipomucino, or the San Acacio, you know, that's where I find. It's not like I'm just going through a book. You know, like I said, it's easy to copy. It's easy to, you know, see these guys. But, you know, what, what's their story? And how is that going to transfer into what you're going through now or what I'm going through? 